glad that y'all are here this morning. Let's get started and let's worship God. I can do anything. I can do all things. Cause it's you who gives me strength. Nothing is impossible through you. Blind eyes are open. Strongholds are broken. I am living by faith. Nothing is impossible. Let's clap this morning. this morning let's get started and let's worship God I can do anything I can do all things cause it's you who gives me strength nothing is impossible through you blind eyes are open strongholds are broken I am living by faith nothing is impossible Not gonna live by what 
that chorus a little bit. I will build my life. In holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me into love to those around me. God, we choose to build our life on one foundation your son Jesus who came and died for us it is the only foundation that is solid it is the only thing that will sustain the chaos of our lives so we're so grateful today Um, we choose we don't feel it maybe some of us are going through some crazy stuff but we choose today to step onto that firm foundation today Mm. because God you are so good to us Church, if you take a seat for just a second, we're going to do what we always do on first Sundays, and we're going to receive communion together. If you did not receive a little communion cup, they bring the buckets by, and you can grab one. But I just want to encourage you for a moment. Do this, if you will. Um, Would you take a second and close your eyes and search your own heart? And here's what I mean by that. There's a scripture that's pretty, uh, pretty direct. It says this. It says, if you have angst or something against your brother, then leave the altar and fix it and then come back. It's pretty strong scripture. And I just want to ask you for a second to stop in your heart. You know, on the one hand, it's the holiday season and that's a cool thing. On the other hand, it seems like that brings up all the emotions of broken relationships sometimes, you know. Would you take a second and choose to forgive? again maybe it's the hundredth time or it feels like the thousandth time that's okay we just choose in this moment to let go grudges hurts things maybe that go all the way back to our childhood because we want to approach God's throne today we want to approach with a pure heart And that, that's, that is so fitting that we would have an amber alert. Here's what I mean. How many of you know just chaos is constantly around us? Like there's a child somewhere right now in, in danger. We don't usually think about that, right? But it's going on all the time everywhere. It's, it's chaos around us. All we have, listen to me, all we have to hold on to, all we have as a firm foundation is Jesus. So, Father, we pray for this child right now. Would you do what only you can do, God? I don't know the words to pray. I don't, I don't know what to say. Whether it's an innocent bystander, it's a police officer. God, would you please protect this little one? And let them come to be who you've created them to be. It's amazing. So we're going to talk about for the next several weeks, we're going to talk about peace. And um, well, I've already talked to two or three of you before church this morning, and uh, it was it was kind of chaos stories. And so I'm not going to rush today, if that's all right with you guys. Um, my goal today is that you might sit here for a few minutes and just go, Whew. you know what I mean? It's in God's presence that peace comes into our souls. And the reason we have that peace, it's only one reason, and that's the cross. And that's a God who loves you so much and loves me so much, and man, am I grateful because I can be really unlovable, you know what I mean? How about you? And yet he loves us enough to send his son to die for us. And then he says, every once in a while, what I'd like for you to do is I'd like you to do this little ceremonial thing called, we call it communion. And I want you to take some some bread and we have a little wafer, we do it differently, dealing with COVID stuff and just trying to be, but you know, honestly, it's just a wafer, it's just bread, it's symbolic. What it's symbolic of is that Jesus, creator of the universe, 
sitting on the throne in perfection. What does it mean to leave perfection and to come here? That stinks. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm like, if I think that through? Like we're all hoping to get out of this crazy place and get to perfection, right? To heaven. And I know anyone and everyone who's ever gone there, I don't care how much we loved them or they loved us or they miss family, all that. I promise you if we could talk to all of them, they'd be like, oh no, I'm good. I'm staying right here, right? But Jesus would leave perfection in heaven and be put into a baby. <laughs> Not a little weird, mind-blowing, created the universe, having to have his diapers changed. All because he wanted to have a relationship with you. That's insane. And so he spent 33 years on this earth and came to the final end, and the final end was for him to be our sacrifice. And that little wafer, the, the bread there, represents his body because his body was beaten and bruised so that anything you have ever done, are doing, or will do that is sinful or outside of God's nature can be forgiven. That's also insane. And so we, we take the wafer and we eat it, and it's, it's a remembrance. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. I want you to grasp for a minute and just remember, as you're eating this wafer, this is peace. This is God saying, my way of bringing peace in the middle of the chaos is I'm going to bring a sacrifice that you and I might have a relationship again, right? And so as you eat that wafer, wafer realize that's Jesus taking your punishment that you might have peace with the Father. But it's really cool because it doesn't stop there. Because then we've got this cup and it's, it's juice. There's nothing significant about it except for that it it represents the blood of Jesus. For somebody new, coming to Christianity may sound weird that we talk about blood, but blood is life. And the scripture says, without the shedding of the blood, there's not the remission of sins. And so what the blood tells us is, is that we do have life. We launched this church on John 10, 10, right? After the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. We see a lot of that chaos around us. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and life to the full. And when we drink this cup, it's about life and life to the full. That Jesus has more for you if we'll just surrender to him. So as you drink the cup, would you realize he came to give peace that you might have life. Amen? Father, thank you for this simple moment that you gave us to, to practice that we might remember you. So we love you, honor you, give you praise. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would sit heavy in this place today. Heal hearts, heal minds, that we might sense the peace that you died that we might have. Jesus, we love you. And all God's people said, amen. How about we give him a little more, more worship? Everybody good with that? Let's stand and worship a little more.
Let's go to the bridge. Because you are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us. Say it again. You are. You are perfect. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us, you are. Your good, good Father is who you are. Is who you are. Sing it with us. You're never gonna let you never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let you never gonna let me down. Say you're never you're never gonna let you never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let you never gonna let me down. You are, you are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, one more time. God, we just thank you for your goodness and your mercy. That God, it continues to chase us. So God, as we enter into your presence even more, that God, we understand the magnitude of your love. So God, the people in this place you know every heart. And even the people that look like we have it together. God, there's some chaos in there. So God, speak to that chaos. So God, where you live, chaos cannot. God, where you dwell, peace has to abound. So God, do what only you can do. And God, we humbly move ourselves out of the way. So God, we love you. We thank you. 
In Jesus' name we pray and everybody said amen. So God, we're so excited that you are here. We're about to go into a time of meet and greet. So if you got a band on, let's be careful. Red means we're social distancing. Yellow means we're just going to be cautious. And green, we're good to go. So find somebody and meet them. again church if you would find your way to your seats that would be awesome if you did not receive an experience guide this morning uh, raise your hand the ushers will be happy to bring you one as well uh, good morning good morning to everybody and thank you for being here at church this morning appreciate you guys um, I'm really excited I have to tell you just a personal thing real quick while they're passing those out if you didn't get a guide raise your hand they'll bring them to you if you need a pen it's got sermon notes etc in it I uh, just want to tell you I have a new sticker on my truck um, and the sticker on my truck says, proud parent of a United States Marine. That's what I'm talking about. So I just, you know, as much as I use my kids sometimes as examples, and sometimes they don't like me using the examples, I thought I'd tell you the good stuff too. How about that? So, so uh, anyway, we're real excited. Be praying for Ayana. She takes a big test in two weeks. Um, and if so, then maybe she goes into intelligence, which is what she wants to do. So we're excited about that opportunity. But anyway, I, uh, I, like I say, over the years, I've used them so often as examples that sometimes it's nice to hear the, the good stuff. So anyway, um, but I just want to say good morning. Welcome. If it's your first time here, we're so glad you're here. And uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Inside of your experience guide, there's a little connection card. Love for you to fill that out and mark first-time visitors so that we know it's your first time here. We would love uh, to be able to just reach out to you. I promise you, no hassle guarantee. Nobody's showing up at your front door. Uh, we just would love to know who you are and communicate a little bit with you about the church. But I um, also want to say, if it's your first time here or others, uh, you may be used to like passing buckets for giving. We don't do that. Our giving boxes are in the back, or there's one over here on the side. So you can put your tithes and offerings in the boxes as you go out. And I want to say thank you guys so much because um, of, of your giving. And, and right now we're in the end of the year where we do legacy offering and you guys have been phenomenal in giving towards the legacy offering. So let me tell you something you've already done. You're going to love this. One of the things that we are excited about, one of the projects I'm personally very excited about just because I've lived the craziness of it, is we're working with Care for Pastors. Pastor Ron Cook, one of our overseers of the church here, has Care for Pastors. What they do is they work with pastors who've been hurt or like, you know, has, have a demon, a deacon board, excuse me, that, you know, kicked them to the curb or, you know, that kind of a deal. And so um, I called Pastor Ron and said, hey, Pastor Ron, do you know any pastors um, or their families that because of what's going on with their church, you know, they just got chased off or whatever, that maybe it's not going to be such a great Christmas or maybe they're not even going to have a Christmas. So I just want you to know, he gave us three names. Um, the, the, the notes have already been sent. Tim and Jennifer are in Pennsylvania, Michael and Jessica are in New York, and Rob and Stephanie are in Texas. And here is one of the notes that I wrote this week so that you know. Dear Michael and Jessica, thank you for the work you do for the kingdom. Our church is praying for you, and we know God has a great plan for you both. Merry Christmas, Pastor Mike and the Church of the Lakes family. P.S. Do not spend this on ministry. This is for you. And in each one of those, we put a $500 check you put a $500 check. So thank you. There's three pastors' families that are going to get a, a little Christmas encouragement this year. So that's one thing. And then, of course, you guys have been doing the police department. So this says, Heather, this is to Heather Diadio, by the way. This is for you. It says, Heather, I want to take a minute and say thank you for the letters and of your thoughtfulness and your prayers. It means so much to me and my family to know that there are people in our community who are so supportive, especially when times are tough 
on everyone. I pray that you and yours remain safe and healthy. Grateful, Lieutenant Scott Mack, Leesburg Police Department. So for all of you guys, so this is for you, Heather, but for all of you guys that are, that are continuing to support our police department, you have no idea. One of our ladies ran into an officer and said, um, you know, have you gotten stuff? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she said, yeah, we've got to the point where now we run to our mailboxes because we want to see if there's something else in there. And so let me encourage you, continue to pray. We told him we'd pray through the end of the year. But let me also encourage you, if you want to do another round of letters, send them a Christmas card or something. I would love to deliver that. Um, for those of you who didn't get to participate, if you want, let us know on a Connect card and we'll give you a name and you can write a Christmas card to somebody. So we took all 91 uh, employees of the Leesburg Police Department and every one of them have been prayed for day, did, every day by name by at least one but some multiple and they've been getting letters and gifts and presents so, th so thank you church for being who you are um, and allowing that to be the scenario so really excited about uh, what God's going with that and then want to just uh, remind the, the youth they got their Christmas party and then Christmas Eve is at 6 30 uh, so come join us for Christmas Eve service it's going to be fantastic uh, dress up Wear an ugly sweater, whatever you want to do, it doesn't matter, but we are going to have Christmas cookies, coffee, and my wife said hot chocolate or milk if it's too hot. That's what she said. So, uh, but anyway, so it's going to be a great night for family, and uh, it's, it's, it's funny because I have officially, I don't know about you, I've officially gone into Christmas mode. Anybody else? Um, is there anybody else that felt this year like that the world was trying to force you into Christmas mode too early? Like the radio station, what is up with playing Christmas music? You know, like I'm okay with it now, but like several weeks ago I was going, it ain't time yet, people, you know, but I am thoroughly in the mode now and kind of have that. So I was thinking um, about, about Christmas songs that we sing, and they're really kind of weird um, if you really read some of our Christmas songs. Like what is Around Yon Virgin? Google it. I dare you to Google it. Because there's people that have written whole like blogs about what round yon virgin means. Because some people say, well, she was round. She was pregnant. But she wasn't. It says round yon virgin, mother and child. She had already given birth. Anyway, our songs are kind of strange. Like, like, uh, do you hear what I hear? You, you know that one? Do you hear what I hear? Right? Said the little lamb to the shepherd boy. Two possibilities. We need to check the shepherd's thermos. <laughs> or we got to get him out of that pasture and get him some therapy, right? I mean, one, uh, here, here's the other one. Um, a child, a child shivers in the cold. Let us bring him silver and gold. How about a blanket? <laughs> right? Like, he's got pneumonia, but he's loaded. It's all good. <laughs> right? And, and so I, 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 what I want to do is kind of challenge and, and I'm going to challenge one particular song today, and I love the song. We're going to sing it at Christmas Eve, so don't hear me poo-pooing on the song as we kind of talk about this song, Silent Night. But what I want to kind of point out to you is what commercialization of Christmas has done to actually skew the meanings. Are, are you following what I'm saying? And so I want to look at this because this whole concept of Silent Night, when you hear that song, what do you picture? Like, because... I picture like a nativity scene that's all kind of nice and holy and it's got like a, a blue background because I like blue and you know it's, it's just and it's and it's kind of this and you kind of the angels are singing and all the right you know like we have this perfect little picture but I want you to understand that night that we're singing about was nothing it, w there was nothing silent about that night let's think through this what were they going to do in the first place you know what they were going to do? They were going to pay their taxes. They were going to the census, and they'd have to pay taxes. In other words, it was April 15th. Let me ask you, how silent and peaceful is April 15th for you, right? Or however long you try to get an extension and pay later on a certain date. But, but, but they were going to pay their taxes, okay? And scholars say she's between 13 and 17 years old. She's a pregnant, hormonal 15-year-old. Oh, it was a silent night, right? Better yet, ladies, for those of you who are pregnant, she's nine months pregnant riding on a donkey. Then they pull up to the door, and they say, no, we've got no place for you. I got a picture in my head. I got a picture in my head of just a moment. She kind of loses her mind. Her face goes demonic. 
And she looks at Joseph and says, you do something. You know what I'm saying? Besides that, Joseph, he was probably about 30. This was an arranged marriage. They probably did not know each other very well, which meant, you know what? They didn't have all the ooey gooey, I love you, I love you too. No, you hang up first. It wasn't like that. Right? Listen, it was, it was not like that at all. It was total chaos. What kind of drama is going on on top of this? She's a teenager telling everyone, well, I know we're not married, but the Holy Spirit did this. You know you wouldn't have believed her either. Like, so listen, so we sing this song, Silent Night, and we get this picture in our head when it was, there was nothing silent about it. Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying? Like, it was, it was total chaos. It was a total mess. And this is what God chooses to send his son into. And here's what I know about my God. He never does anything accidentally. He is always intentional, right? So what is God's intention? To send Jesus, send Jesus into this chaotic, we like to make it pretty. We like to put it on Christmas card. Or some of you have a nativity scene. Maybe you've already set it up in your house. And we, it's all nice and peaceful. And yet that's not exactly what's going on here. Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying to you? And, and, and so why would God do that? And I think it's this, this is why. Because your life is crazy. And my life is crazy. And the son, of the, uh, son of, the, uh, of, of the father comes, not in perfect, peaceful, wonderful scenario. He comes into crazy so that he can relate to your crazy. In other words, I have this picture. Scripture says when we pray that Jesus is sitting next to the father interceding for us. So when you have chaos going on in your life, and you pray to God, God, please hear me on this. Like I'm losing my mind here or this crazy situation or I got this doctor's report or whatever. That Jesus is sitting there and he hears it and he turns to the, to the father and goes, that's hard. I remember what that felt like. Like we don't have a distant God, right? Who's sitting up here distant from us looking down at your little miserable existence going, get your junk together. We have a God that relates to us in the middle of the chaos. Are, are you hearing what I'm saying to you? And while we're all trying to create the perfect little Christmas scene in our homes and in our families, doesn't it seem like that the chaos continues? Doesn't it seem like that, that it's hard to create that? Let me, let me read a little bit more of the, the Christmas story out of Luke 2, 6 and 7. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger. I don't know about you, but just when I read that, I, I, something inside of me goes, in a manger. It's a food trough, y'all. Right? But do you understand what I'm saying? Like what commercialization has done to actually make us overly romanticize what's going on here. Like it probably stunk. Like maybe it had cow saliva in the bottle. Like there was slobber, cow slobber there. Right? This is a food trough. That's, that's what this, 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 is, this is chaos. This is absolute chaos. Because there was no room for them in the end. What I'm trying to get you to recognize is that maybe we've misrepresented a bit this silent night with wonderful, beautiful, beautiful nativity scenes. But I also just want you to know again that God does it because he wants to relate to us. So now today, to celebrate the season of Christmas, there's a phrase that I think probably if you were going to have a motto of this season in our culture, I think this would be the motto. Because you see it in commercials, you see it on Christmas cards, you see it everywhere, and that is peace on earth. Right? Peace on earth. Like we see it in Christmas cards, and we see, and I want to talk a little bit about peace on earth, because I looked it up. How many times do you think peace on earth happens, that phrase happens in the scriptures? And the answer is once. Let me read it to you. Luke 12 and 51, Jesus says, do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No. I came to bring division. Wait, what? Like we put this on all our Christmas cards and all this kind of thing. See, I need you to hear something. The concept of peace on earth is not a biblical concept. I'm going to stretch you here a little bit to think with me for a moment. But if you've got a peace bumper sticker, listen to me, you're actually talking about something that is not a biblical concept. 
Are you, are you hearing me? And I'll, I'll prove it to you. We're, we're going to talk through this a little bit. But I, I want you to understand John 16 and 33. Well, let me say it to you this way. I, I put in my notes. Of all recorded history, there are only 286 years where there was no wars going on. Like, we live in chaos. We live in conflict, our entire world. John 16 and 33, I've told you these things so that in me you may, ha- in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So listen to me. The biblical way to say the phrase is not peace on earth. The biblical way to say the phrase, catch this, is peace while on earth. What I want to submit to you today is we've been looking at it wrong because we're trying to create peace out here. That was never Jesus' intent when he came. His intent was to create peace in here. So we're trying so hard. I I got two phone calls this week. One from a mom trying to get her family together, and they're in conflict, and these people this and that, and blah, blah, blah. And Pastor Mike, I just just want to get my family together. I was like, listen to me, you can't force, right? How many of us are trying to force Christmas or force things? How many of you have taken a family picture? And it's an awesome, everybody's like, oh, your family looks fantastic. And you are the only person that knows. 15 seconds before that camera snapped, you looked at somebody and said, smile or I will smack you. Right? Right? That's, that's this, this, this chaos that, that, that we kind of live in. And so today I want to talk to you about the concept of peace and what I think the biblical concept of peace actually is. So let's start with what takes away our peace. Let's talk about a couple things that take away our peace. Number one, number one is unavoidable, un- unavoidable circumstances right? Just stuff happens. Would you agree? Like we just get kind of sideswiped, right? Listen, you can insure it, you can clean it, and stuff is still going to happen to it, right? Like it doesn't matter how much insurance you have. It doesn't have, like you're always going uh, to, we, we uh, ran out to, to the Promise Ranch yesterday, and I was laughing because I stopped, saw Don, they were working on something, and I said, what are you doing? He's like, well, we always got something to do. And I just thought about this concept. Like, isn't there always something to, something to fix at your house? Something more to clean up? You know, you blow off the driveway and 10 minutes later the leaves are covering the driveway. And isn't that the story of our life of spinning our wheels trying to create Camelot, trying to create perfection, trying to keep everything so, and we're trying to create peace out here. Listen, Jesus never intended for us to make peace out here. Peace on earth is not a biblical concept. Peace while on earth is the biblical concept. It's, it's, it's in me, right? Look at, look at uh, this, this particular verse. It says, Jeremiah, disaster follows disaster. The whole land lies in ruin. In an instant, my tents are destroyed, my shelter in a moment. You go, well, that's not very positive. Well, that's because we've actually bought some kind of weird, positive thinking kind of theology that's actually not what's going on around us which is why often we're so frustrated or we're discombobulated because we're thinking we can just like make things out here right and that somehow that's going to make things in here right. And that's the, that's the wrong direction. It's got to be things in here to create peace around me. Do you, are, you, are you tracking with me on that? What else? How about this one? Anybody have any unbearable people in your life? How about sitting next to you? No, don't raise your hand. I was kidding. It's a joke. I mean really unbearable people. Like I tell the story every once in a while about going up. A couple years ago, I went up to the villages. It was maybe a little bit longer than that. But it was when Sam's, I didn't know Sam's Club was opening that particular day. And so the the come around the corner, headed up towards the villages, and there's just traffic, traffic, traffic. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. And I saw an opening to cut into a parking lot. And so I cut into the parking lot. I didn't know. I cut into the Sam's parking lot. Well, Sam's was, was the issue. So there's just, I mean, it's wall-to-wall people. So I'm driving through the parking lot, and this is the parking lot. Like, I'm going seven, maybe, and, and this guy in a Corvette literally cuts me off. Like, I'm the right-of-way. He's coming out of the lane. Cuts me off. I'm like, Burr! and I look up. Dude tells me I'm number one, and then speeds off. And I'm like, no, you, you don't get to do that. You, you pulled in front of me. What are you, you know what I'm talking about? I, you can't make this stuff up. Two rows later, the exact same thing happened with a little old lady in a Prius, and she flicked me off too. And 
I pulled out of that Sam's parking lot, and no offense to you, those of you who are villagers, I love you, but I was like, I'm never coming to the villagers ever again. <laughs> right? You ever, like, like you work with people that just drive you crazy? You know, somebody lighten up, Francis. But anyway, Psalm 109.3, with the words of hatred, they surround me. They attack me without cause. You ever feel like somebody just comes at you sometime without cause? Like, what the heck did I do? Or why is, yeah. How about this one? Unexplainable problems take away your peace. Things that you just, I want answers. Anybody else want answers? Right? Like something goes down and you're just like, I want to know why. I don't understand. This is ridiculous. I think the biggest thing that I could think of in my life was when Jen and I lost our baby. And I can remember, I didn't stay there for long because I couldn't because I knew I would go to a very dark place. But I remember for a very short time period in my very kind of fleshly moment that I was like, you know what, God? There's idiots around here having kids. Like, why are you letting them have kids? And why you take mine? Right? Like, we, we all have those moments that are just unexplainable, that we don't have a real, but you can't stay there for long, right? We've got to trust that God has a plan, right? I've said it to you numerous times. I really believe that heaven doesn't sound like harps. I really believe that heaven sounds like this. Oh, right, right? And then a whole other group of people come in and they go, oh my, OMG, no kidding, that was good, God, you're right, right? Like, like, He's got it all worked out, and we're going to know in the end, but sometimes, man, it's really hard to trust him. Even Jesus experienced that feeling. Listen to this, Matthew 27, on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's a why question that even Jesus, our Savior, knew that feeling. Probably all of us lose peace to this last one, and that is uncontrollable worry. Got any worriers in the house? <laughs> Like, worry is crippling. And, and you know what? We all worry. We don't want to. And some of us, we are worriers and we won't admit it. Oh, no, I'm good. I don't worry about anything. But then we snap at somebody because we're stressed out about something. That's, that's called worry. And, and, and worry is just kind of is, is a, little, a little overwhelming. Jeremiah 6 and 24, we have heard reports about them. So in other words, Jeremiah heard something. Here comes a rumor or something. And our hands hang limp. Anguish has gripped us pain like that of a woman in labor. So these are all issues that we have regularly, right? So what about this concept of peace on earth? Because the scripture seems to repeat over and over again that you're going to have problems. If you're going to have problems, you're going to have problems, but what about peace on earth? Now some of you, before I go any further, some of you think I didn't do my research. Because you're in your head going, I saw the Charlie Brown special, and I heard Linus read that verse. And he used the phrase peace on earth, Pastor Mike. Let me read that verse for you. It's Luke 2, 10 through 14. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appear with the angels, praising God and saying, here it comes, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. Two men on whom his favor rests. Wait a minute. There's peace on whom his favor rests. That's different. Doesn't that sound a little different? Right? It's, 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 it's about his favor. So the most accurate translation of this, of this particular scripture is on earth peace to those who have his goodwill. So meaning there's peace available in the middle of the turmoil of this earth to those who God gives favor to. Well, that's sort of a different concept completely, right? The, the, the scripture describes favor, catch this, as on those who God chooses to give it to. Now, this culture is gonna go, well, that's not fair. To which I will say this. There's only one fair, happens in April, it'll be out at the fairgrounds, right? Because God's God, he can do what he wants, when he wants, 
how he wants. And his ways are higher than our ways and thoughts are higher than he's way smarter than you and me. So be careful about questioning God. But I want to get back to this because the obvious next question to me is, how do I position my life to be in God's favor? Right? Like if I, if I, if I want God's favor so that I have peace in the middle of the chaos, what does that, what does that actually look like? And that's what we're going to talk about for the next few weeks. The word is this, peace. Peace. What does it really mean to experience peace? It's, it's important for us to understand. If you're waiting for peace on earth, listen to me, you're going to be waiting a long, long time. Right? It's not, it's not coming. It's not, it's not happening. So what we should be working on, catch this, is not getting peace but getting God's favor. Let's say that one more time. That we work on not trying to find, create, or get peace, but that we actually find ourselves in the favor of God. See, there's a gift available to you, and it's not because it's Christmas. Let me read it to you. John 14 and 27. I'm leaving you with a gift, Jesus said. Peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give isn't fragile like the peace the world gives you. So don't be troubled or afraid. So what I want to do today, and what I want to do for the next several weeks leading all the way through into Christmas Eve, is I want to talk about peace. But specifically today, I want to give you four very practical things that I know, I know, if you will dive into these four things, listen to me, it will cause God to look upon you with favor and bring peace, not here, here. Are you tracking with me? Right? So let's, let's look at these last four things. Number one. Number one is you've got to receive God's pardon. You've got to receive God's pardon. Anyone who has ever sinned needs forgiveness. Anyone who's ever done something wrong has to have a time when there's forgiveness. And some of us here today, maybe we've been in church for a long time, but you still carry guilt. You still carry shame. You still carry these things from the past that somehow the enemy has convinced you that God has forgiven you for kicking the cat. Because everybody should kick a cat. Cats are terrible. I'm kidding. It's a joke. I'm sort of kidding. Anyway, are animals in heaven? Cats aren't. But anyway, I'm kidding. Don't write me an email. Or write me an email. Just send it to Mike's not going to read it.com. Okay. Um, but, <laughs> I will read your emails. Listen, we need, <laughs> we need God's pardon. You need God's forgiveness in your life. And for some of us, listen to me, for some of you here, you've been walking with God for years, but you're still holding on to some stuff. And listen to me, psychologists say the biggest cause of stress is guilt. You have a gift afforded to you today. That gift is pardon. I love the word pardon. You know what pardon is? Pardon is when someone in authority, for no reason whatsoever, right? There's no merit to, well, they might be doing it for political reason, but this person hasn't done anything to earn it or anything else. And they just, with a stroke of a pen, go, done, let them go. And you have that available to you. That with a stroke of a pen, the creator of the universe can write your name in what is called the Lamb's Book of Life. Right? Which is the only thing that's going to get checked when you go to heaven and determine where you spend eternity. Is they're going to look in that book and see if your name is in that book of life. And it's just as simple, listen to me, as you today truly saying, I accept the pardon. I have to not only accept it, now I have to go live it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Like, we gotta re- you have to receive, really receive God's pardon. Romans 5 and 1, therefore, since we have been justified, what it means to be justified is pardoned. You're clean. No guilt. That's what's amazing and so hard for us to fathom because everything in our world has such consequences. But once your name is written in the book of life, 
then all that stuff is, when, when you go and they check the book, they go, okay, we're not even looking at all that stuff. So when Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished. And when he said it is finished, he meant it's finished. All of it. Some of you today just need to have a moment where you say, God, I actually, for the first time, I hear your pardon and I accept it within myself. And I forgive myself because you forgive me. And help me to move forward from this scenario. Some of us are having such a hard time connecting to God because of guilt. You don't need more religion or another church service or even to give more. You just need to receive the free pardon that God gives you through the death of Jesus. Number two. Number two. Run to his presence. You want to find God's favor, you've got to run to his presence. What you need any, more than anything is not a spa day, a beach day, a pajama day, fishing, shopping, riding a motorcycle, or whatever else that you do. What you need more than anything is, is your life, in your life, is to find the presence of God. There's nothing like the presence of God to bring healing, to bring peace. See, in that moment, in that parking lot, in Sam's, <laughs> what I really needed was to pull over into a parking spot and turn on a worship song and refocus my mind and find God's presence. Because if I'd have done that, I'd have been like, you know what, God? I was a butthead like that, and you loved me. I was a butthead like that, and you forgave me. So I forgave them, so I forgive them, and I'm not angry. See, when we find God's presence, it redirects our thinking. It redirects our mind. Are you hearing? Like, you have, this is why you've got to have quiet time. You've got to have time that you get in his word. Some of us are going out and going about our day, and it's like going to war without any kind of preparation. Like, we've got to have God's presence in our life. This is why we do 21 days of prayer and fasting coming in January. It's, it's for 21 days for us to make a real commitment to be in his word and to try to find him and to try to experience him and understand And For some of you, you're like, you know, I don't know, and I'm trying to listen to me. Don't stop. Don't give up. When you're developing a relationship, is it always awkward at first? Of course it is, right? But we continue to push in and say, God, would you show me your presence? Look at Isaiah 26 and 3. You will keep in perfect peace. How many of you would like perfect peace, right? You will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is, catch this, steadfast. Because he trusts in you. Some of you need to pull away this afternoon. Listen to some worship. Read his word. Take a walk with God. Yeah, but, but I got too much to do today, is our usual response. And listen to me. Hear me on this. You have too much to do today to not spend time with him. Because if you don't, the too much stuff is going to eat you for lunch. It's going to be the chaos. That, that, that have, you have no peace. Right? So we've got to receive God's pardon. We've got to run to God's presence. Number three, listen to me. Here's a tough one. We've got to respect God's principles. If you want God's favor, you're going to have to respect his principles. Listen to me. Whatever you are violating that is God's principles in our life, that is the source of chaos and the lack of peace in your life. Now, this one's hard. This one's a kind of preaching, finger-pointing type of point, but I, I need you to catch and hear this. Listen to me. We are a culture that has begun to kind of water down God's Word. We are a culture that reads something in the Bible and go, well, yeah, but I just feel like blah, 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 blah. And we set up our feelings over God's truth. If you want God's favor in your life, if you want God's peace in your life, you got to respect his principles. Hear me on this. Every once in a while, I read something in the Bible too that I just go, well, that stinks. Right? Because I have a sinful nature. Like, turn the other cheek, nothing, I'm going to knock that dude's head off. Right? Love your enemies, pray for your enemies. Pray for them to get bed bugs. Right? Listen to me. But when we respect God's principles and put them into play, listen, it will bring favor. That favor on your life will bring peace, the real peace. Psalm 119, 165, great peace have they who love your law. 
and nothing can make them stumble. So read your Bible and obey it. Can you say that one again? Read your Bible and obey it. Just do what it tells you to do. Fight your sinful nature. Fight everything around you, even when it's, I, I know it's crazy, no matter how crazy or counterculture or counter your feelings that it is, do what God's word says when it comes to your relationships. Get out of that unhealthy relationship. That's, that's, don't, don't come to me and say, you told me to get divorced. That's not what I'm saying and you know it. Listen to me. You need healthy practices in respecting God's principles with your finances. It's Christmas time. Don't lose your mind. Be a good steward of what God's given you. Listen to me. Tithe. Trust God with it. See what happens. Like, Father, respect his principles. We just need to get back to some simplicity. Maybe it's being baptized. Maybe you're an adult and you're like, oh, I don't want to get baptized. You know, I feel like, listen to me. The scripture says, go into all the world, preach the gospel. Make disciples and baptize them in the name of our Father. Maybe you need to get baptized. Maybe that's just an, it's just simply an obedience thing. Listen to me. God is not looking for the best. He's not looking for the best looking and the smartest and the coolest and all that sort of stuff. You know what God is looking for? Available. And when you submit yourself to him, it's amazing what he can do. Yeah, even with you even with me, right? Respect God's principles. Number four, last one, I'm going to close. And we've got to rely on God's provision. Rely on God's provision. He needs to be the one that we go tell your problems to first. Before you go running to that person, it's amazing because we'll have a financial problem and we'll call our friend who filed bankruptcy two years ago. Right? We're, we're having marriage trouble, so what do we do? Call our single friend. That's brilliant. Listen to me. You have a heavenly father that wants you to bring to him your problems, and you've got to develop that relationship with him. You've got to develop time where you talk and spend time with him. Philippians 4 and 6. Don't worry about anything. Well, that sounds easy enough. That's, no, that's crazy. You're going to worry, but listen to me. Don't worry about it. In other words, don't keep worrying about it. Instead, what do you do? Pray. Every time you start to worry, that's a sign for you to stop in that moment and talk to God. Every time. If you'll start doing just that one principle, you'll start finding a little more peace. Tell God your needs and don't forget to, what? Don't forget to thank him for the answers. I forget to do that. I forget when I'm in the middle of the chaos. To go, God, I don't understand why we lost this baby and I don't understand why this is the deal and blah 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 but you know what God I thank you that you do have an answer I thank you that I am going to see the answer I thank you at some point I'm going to get to go oh got it because see for Mike if we had had our own kids Maybe I would have never told you about my sticker because maybe we would have never adopted. Would I give up to her for anybody else? Not a million years. So wherever you are today, whatever it is, God's got provision. There's a reason if you will just be tenacious in finding yourself in relationship with him. Are, are you hearing me, church? Man, he's... He's got a plan. It is so good. But Mike is so impatient and such a control freak. Anybody else? And what I want more than anything, I want you to have an amazing Christmas holiday. But not because of what you get. Not because the family dinner went down without the election coming up. Right? Not any of those things. I would love for you to refer back to 2020 and the chaos of this year and go, but let me tell you what I got at Christmas time. Peace. That's what I want for you. I want, I want you to have peace. 
So I double dog dare you to put these things into play and to dive in. That God has more for you and a peace for you. But we've got to do those things. We've got to find his presence. We, we've, we've got to respect his principles and his word. We've got to know that he provides all and will provide all. Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying to you this morning? And so everybody here has got a different thing today. Holy Spirit speaking to each one of you differently. Some of you here today, you need the pardon, right? Go back to the beginning. You're the one that says, you know, I've never actually given my heart to God and asked him to forgive me of all my sins. And he'll do that today if you sincerely ask him to do that. Some of you need a pardon today, right? Some of you today just need to run to his presence. We're going to worship just a little bit more and give you a chance to stop and say, you know what? I need to find myself in your presence again. Some of you know, listen to me, you've got some secret sin. you got something in a way that you're living that's outside of what God has said. And I want to challenge you today to maybe pray with somebody of our prayer team. But I want to challenge you that you can, you can, you can get out of it and we can help you. We've all been there. We're all fighting our own stuff. Respect this principle and then trust in all of it. Listen to me. He's got it all worked out exceedingly, abundantly more than we can ever think or imagine. Ephesians 3.20, right? Let me pray for you this morning. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for reminding us what real peace is. It's about what you're doing inside of us and in our hearts. For those today that need to receive your pardon, give them courage to pray a prayer maybe like this. Jesus, today I give you my life you my heart. I ask you to forgive me. God, I want to see and receive your total forgiveness today. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for loving me. I surrender my heart and life to you today. And God, for the rest of us, as we go through this Christmas season, that we might find peace within peace with you, your favor upon us and our family as we put into practice what you have told us to do. We pray it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Would you stand for a second and let's, let's sing this song again because after the teaching I feel like it's just that much more pertinent again. And I will be
says, get understanding, right? What I hope to have accomplished today with you is in all the Christmas madness and all the chaos, that you might work on creating peace in here and not just out here, right? By finding favor with God. So let's go and be and, be and do what God has spoken over us today. Can we do that? Yes? And uh, we're going to have life steps for those who haven't been through life steps. Today, step one, would love to have you here down the hallway to the left. I'll meet you down there. Um, but man, let's, uh, let's, let's find God's peace inside of us during the season that we might be the peacemakers in what has turned into a pretty chaotic culture, right? That's who God's called us to be. So, all right, church, have a great week. We'll see you next week. Amen.